How you doing? It's Mick Tully for the World of Martial Arts Television. And uh, I've already apologised to him ahead of time because the intro is going to be a bit of a gusher. Because the thing is, I'm with Kev Capel, who's literally an OG when it comes to BJJ in the UK, first of all. But in the world of martial arts, where you're full of like complete clowns and nine times out of ten guys you just wouldn't want to spend any time with, Kev's one of the very few that's just a really just good, decent guy. Uh, I I mean this every time I see him at a competition, right? I, it yeah, you know, just lights up and it just makes my day because we always have a great chat and we talk about so and we small talk for about thirty seconds and then it's like he'll he'll say something that'll make me go home and I will have to rethink everything. So uh, and, and and I do mean that, Kev. It's like you know you, you we'll, we'll get into it as we're as we're chatting, but yeah, okay. mate, I've been trying to get you since the British Nogi. 2014 to get you to do a podcast that's how long I've, it's taken to to get you here I'm reliable, I'm. that's how i'm reliable. hey so <laughs> hey yeah, now you're, you're the man you're the man so what we're going to do is first of all welcome and secondly we're going to start at the beginning because it's always a good place to start okay. how'd you get into martial arts man um <clears throat> well i guess I wanted to do some karate when I was a kid. I think I was about 10, 10 or 11, something like that. And um, maybe it was Karate Kid or, or some film. Uh, but my dad took me down to the local karate school and they didn't start till 12, 12 years old. Um, yeah. So I was just a bit young. So my, my dad took me to a boxing club because he knew, the guy, he knew one of the coaches there. Uh, so I started boxing in 1985, 1986, and I had my first amateur bout when I was 11 in 1986. So I started with boxing, um, kind of fell in love with that. It's it right in the Hagler Hearns. I think that's the first fight I ever watched was Hagler Hearns won, you know, wow. as a 10 year old. You know, I mean, because the thing is, I watched Rocky, you know, that was a big film, you know, 1984, 1985, when I, when I saw it, big film, Rocky 1, Rocky 2. And then I watched Hagler Hearns and I was like, I always like the films because that was like a yeah. you know I mean? thing from a film. It's not a normal fight. Um, so I just kind of fell in love with boxing. Uh, didn't really want to do anything else once I started boxing. Um, joined the army, uh, was told at the recruiting office that, yeah, you know, you'll basically get to box full time, which was a load <laughs> of rubbish. But um, that also made me, because I'd, I'd had enough of school. I wasn't, I'm much more academic now than I was when I was, uh, uh, younger um so yeah the 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 army was a you know a way to continue to boxing which i managed to do a little bit but not not as much as as if i'd have been in different regiments because what you find out when you're in the army is it, it's it's very fragmented so some some regiments will have really strong boxing teams some regiments will have really good tug of war teams and and, and you won't really get to excel in any, any other sport if it's not the the regimental yeah a choice kind of thing um but did manage to box a little bit um along the way got to meet some karate guys and kung fu guys you know early 90s and anytime it kind of kicked off in the barracks they weren't really any more prepared for it than anyone else apart from like the you know the boxers and rugby players they were the tough lads yeah so you know i you know stayed on the course of boxing and then only really got into my what i mean I now, at the time, I didn't consider boxing a martial art, but now with the onset of MMA and everything, it's definitely a sport first, but it's a very key component of, of good martial arts. So, but to me, the kickboxing side of things was always true martial arts. So I started that when I left the army. I was going to box, but a girlfriend knew a, a guy who ran a kickboxing club. So I went there and sparring with the guys, I could kind of rely on my hands a lot little bit of taekwondo type kicking stuff um and then because i i get into stuff I, you know if i do something i you know if i like something i'm 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 all in uh, that's probably my character really i'm either all in or all out if i'm not really into something yeah. it never really get me to commit to it but um her friend her friend run a kickboxing club so i went there and then i was training every day and they weren't running enough sessions for me and someone said oh well there's actually a guy called neil mcleod who lived around the corner from me who yeah. was married who was married to the daughter of my dad's best friend no way yeah yeah so Ra rachel um, yeah rachel yeah is kevin flynn's daughter and kevin oh, wow. flynn 
worked with my dad for a long time. One of the reasons I'm called Kevin is because his the best friend was Rachel's dad called Kevin. Oh wow! I, 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 know, I believe that, that was one of the you know one of the reasons, or, or, or certainly that was said to me as a kid. Oh yeah, you're named after me, kind of thing. So, so there was a connection there. Went and seen Neil, and obviously you know Neil and uh, you know his lineage with Bob Breen and Dan and Asanto. I immediately seen a massive difference in the style of training and the functionality. Neil loved my boxing. You know, he was very complimentary straight away, going, I oh, know you've got good hands, good hands, you'll do well. So, you know, I found home with Neil. Um, we went up to a Dan and the Santos seminar up at Rick Young's up in Edinburgh. And on the way back, he said, oh, I've got an MMA fight. And, I, and I'd worked the corner in the boxing, you know, doing the boxing bouts. And um, I said, who's in your corner? He said, no one. This is like year 2000, 2001. Yeah. He was doing an MMA fight, and I think he had one of the guys from the gym maybe doing his corner. So I said, well, I've done corners. So I, I can help you out. Watch this fight, which was excellent. It was him versus Danny Patton. Yeah. So Danny Patton's a, 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 you know, an old-school guy as well. He um, is, indeed. And I see the fight, and I was like, fucking hell, yeah, I, I fancy that, because that is MMA. Awesome this, That's yeah. um, so I said to the promoter that night, I said, oh, can you get me in on the next show? And then it all started from there. I, I I've been training with Mauricio for about six months. That was off of the back of a Bob Breen seminar down in London. Yeah. Rick Young showed a, he was, Rick Young was a blue belt, I believe from Higgin, but he had a lot of respect for Mauricio and um, he showed an arm bar and I was like, man, where can I do more of this? And he said, well, honestly, you're probably best off going to a judo club. Um, and then I think he told Neil, oh, Mauricio started up near you. And Neil said to me, oh, if you want to do more jiu-jitsu up in Marlebone there, you can do some jiu-jitsu. So oh, that was when that was on Mauricio. Came. Mauricio Thank was you. in Marlebone then, yeah. Yeah, Marlebone. And um, Marlebone from Aylesbury Station, it's a direct route. It's 55 minutes. And back in the day, if you had to, you could jump the turnstiles and there wasn't too much. So, you know, <laughs> it was doable. You know, getting up there was doable. You know, less than an hour journey. You know, sometimes free of charge if you come back late enough. And so I, I could train with Neil, train with um, Mauricio, and off the back of what Ring Rick Young said, I'd start doing some judo at a local judo club. So, and that was all around 2000, 2001, just so I was kind of leaving the army. Um, after the 9 11 attacks, I had to go back for a, uh, a year uh, just on tour in Kosovo to make up the numbers there while everything was going a bit crazy. But yeah, all about the time I left the army, boxing was everything I'd done. And then bumped into Neil, bumped into Mauricio, started doing judo off the back of, of a really yeah. young show, armbar. And, and yeah, it, it just come together from there. And that was all 2000, 2001. It's so interesting you said that because my my real my real introduction to jiu-jitsu was obviously, uh, you remember the good old days, you, you know, you pick up Combat Magazine. This is back when magazines were worth reading, right? So you pick them up. And there'd be some guy working out of like a, a social club or a school hall. And then there'd be a little article and it'd be like, and it'd be on about the Gracie challenge. And I've said this so many times. I used to look at it and go, but I used to look at it and immediately I thought it was like, you know, like the Johnny Cash song, a boy named Sue. And I was yeah. like, they're all called Gracie. That's a girl's name. No wonder they're all fucking tough. You know what <laughs> I mean? And then you realise that, uh, that they, they properly put it out there to everybody. And you had the old school Gracie Challenge way before, you know, the UFC. And I was like, I saw it, and I, I, I've said several times before, first time I ever watched MMA, it was too visceral for me. And I've been training with Jeff Thompson and like Andy Margaret and Coventry. So I'd seen it, but it was still too visceral to watch. But I, to my shame, I couldn't see how beautiful the jiu-jitsu was. So I flapped it. But the first time I ever did, did any real BJJ was... JKD seminar, Rick Young's teaching it, and I'm like, oh, this, and you know, like Rick's doing that, and he's, one minute he's doing like this Mawashi Gary Gidan roundhouse kick, yeah. and then he's doing an arm bar that looks like something out of Neil Adams' back pocket, and you're like, I, I want to be like the, the next equivalent of that, or, or somewhere near to that. But like, yeah, when you were crazy. training, yeah, oh, it's crazy, man, crazy. But if you don't mind me asking, what was the early days like? Because when I, uh, when I first met Neil, by the way, I met Neil at an Inno Santo seminar, right? Him and Rachel. And then the next time he was at Cage Warriors, 2004, I think, or 2005. 
and he was fighting uh, Paul McVeigh. Paul McVeigh, yeah. Um, yeah, and my mates, my mates at the time were running Cage Warriors, and what they did was they gave me the money in readies, and I had to go up and give it to Rachel in the stands, and Rachel was there with the kids at the time, and it's quite a famous fight because that was where he turned up, and he wasn't wearing a groin box. Goddard was refing it. And Goddard says, yeah, I haven't got a groin box. And he and Neil was like, do I have to wear one? Because And Goddard's like, I'd advise you to wear one, but you don't have to wear one. So he fought that, and then the streaker came in and everything. But those early days, there, do you remember it, right? So those early days of like MMA was like the, the Wild West. So what was it like training with Neil McLeod? Was it as intense as I can imagine? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Neil, Neil elevated my level through the roof, really, because... We were the same weight. Um, I wasn't working like regular work. So I, I was available to train. I think I booked a load of privates with him because I just wanted to train with him anyway. And we ended up kind of becoming sparring partners. And I think I trained with him. I think Neil had 17 or 18 fights, um, which is a lot. And I think I must have been his main sparring partner for at least 14 or 15 of them. Wow. I would say that's probably correct. Um, definitely, dub definitely double figures, and we're still good friends now. It was his birthday on Halloween, so we just quickly spoke by text. But, um, but we're still friends now. We don't train much together. I don't think we, you know, either of us train in the same way anymore. Um, but at the time, we would do ten five-minute rounds of MMA sparring. That was that. Uh, 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 ends an even minutes. number, and five minutes was the length of the rounds. And, and wow, and, know, and, 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 and what what people don't understand is like Neil McLeod was one of those guys that look, right now, if he, if he'd have been born fifteen years later, he'd be in the UFC with, with his work ethic oh, and, and killing it. When, when when Neil was at his peak, there wasn't even a middleweight category in the UFC. It was just open weight. And we kind of knew, I mean, I think it's one, not saying that I'd have been any good at MMA or anything, but one of the reasons I, I kind of went in the direction more of jujitsu was because I knew that at 61 kilos as a, a, on fight day, um, the UFC wasn't really a realistic part for me. No. You know, and I think Neil, Neil felt the same. Um, <clears throat> you know, the size difference would, would have always been a factor. And, it wasn't even available to people from the UK anyway. You know, Lee Remedius, Mark Weir, James Zickich and Ian Freeman, they didn't get in, in it until, what, 2004, 2005? Yeah. I, I was at the hall at the Albert Hall and yeah. they were outside giving away tickets. Yeah. Right? If, you, if you ever look at the footage of that, the place is half empty. Right? And it was like they, they couldn't do it. But yeah, those early days, it, it, it is funny you said that because like Eric Paulson's back over... And like Eric's a legend, right? It, yeah, like there's so many. Yeah, he's coming over. So he's coming back over before Christmas. But I remember when I met Eric first. Eric said he had a conversation with Dana White, and he said the way you're going to make the sport work is weight divisions and gloves. And like I, I still remember this conversation. And you look at it now, and you go, how draconian that they were. It wasn't even gloves. So what is going to that's going to lead me on to? Once you first met Maurizio, right? Uh, can you just explain? Your first real experience of rolling with like Maurizio or Roger, or just the first real experience of like being under someone that you just go, I can't believe I'm here. Well, I mean, I didn't spar with Mauricio for probably until later on as a white belt or maybe even a blue belt, just because you know he was an awesome black belt at the time, and um, you know obviously he's red and white belt now, but at the time he was a legit black belt from Brazil. There was no need for him to roll with me. Do you know what I mean? I, I, my yeah. first day at, the, at, the, at his gym in, in uh, Seymour Place, I rolled with a blue belt called Azif, who's a black belt now. And um, Azif was fantastic, but he was under 65 kilos, you know, always a light guy. So I was a similar size, if not a touch bigger at the time. And he had his hands in his belt, legs wide open, just going, come on, pass my guard, pass my guard. No way. And I couldn't. I couldn't. And I was getting annoyed because, and and I love the guy. I, I, he's a good friend now. Azif is a very good friend. But at the time in my 
still squatty mentality. I was like, I should be kicking this guy's ass. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and he just had his way, you know, sweeping. And he was a, he was a very good blue belt, <clears throat> even for the time. Um, but yeah, he just had his way. And, and, and a few guys did throughout, but he, as if it always sticks in my mind because he was, he wasn't even trying. And, um, as I left, you know, I did the full session, did the stretch, got changed. And as I left, Mauricio just patted me on the back and said, see you next week, sir. Like, have a good week like that. And that was it. And yeah. um, that cheered me up a bit because I was feeling pretty down and, and I don't want to be crude. Like I was a different person back then, but I do remember thinking if that was prison, I'd have just been fucked. Yeah. I cannot yeah. allow that to be the situation and, and you know, now saying it out loud, but that was the thought that went into my head. I was, Cause I was like, man, if that was a situation where those guys want to do something to me, what's the worst thing that can happen to a man? You know, in my opinion, that would have happened to me and I wouldn't have been able to do anything. And on the track, yeah, carry on. Most people who have this experience, they're close to tears sometimes after their first jujitsu experience. And I was like, okay, I've got a choice. Either I can hope, that this is just some kind of fitness fad, martial arts fad that's going to die a death and I'll never have to worry about it or I need to get half decent at this. I need at least to be blue belt level in this. Otherwise, I'm not going to sleep at night. And that, that, was, that was my first. Oh, mate, so, you won't believe this. It's so, it's so, it's so bizarre because um, a, bit, a bit like yourself, actually, uh, I should add, after speaking to you at the last British Open and you were talking about reintroducing some kickboxing into your classes, what yeah, I'd yeah. been doing is I'd avoided, I'd avoided doing just no gi. So I've been teaching like CSW, MMA, grappling, the whole lot. And then I was thinking, after, yeah, if Kev's going back, I'll go the other way. And what I'll do is, because everyone's predominantly striking and doing garlic, get them to do grappling. And so, but d taking out all of the so-called equalizers, as you were saying, well, well, I'll just knock you out and I'll do this. It's like, you know, the classic line from Terry Barnett, everyone you say, yeah, but, you know, tell a good right hand will do that. He goes, yeah, but I've got a good right hand too. But what I did was I brought the grappling in and it, I was teaching today and I got a guy and went neon belly on him and he was like, that, oh, and I went, stop the class. And I went, don't, right now, can I just say something? I'm just going to put into, put, I'm going to formulate this for you now because I know where you are, mate. I said, the first time I ever did jujitsu, a guy did a neon belly on me. And, and when he did it, it was the fact that I, I just, it was like Patrick Swayze at the end of Ghost. Like my body was, like the soul was coming out of my body. And I remember thinking, I can't live in a world. I can't live in a world. Bear in mind, I didn't start jujitsu properly for another two years after that, because I still rationalized it in my head that it might, it might not let, it might not carry on. You know what I mean? People might get bored of it. But I remember going and I, I thinking to myself, first of all, I can't live in a world where another human being can do that to me, right? That's one. And then exactly the same story, I use that now. I said, I was there and I was thinking, if I was in prison now, they'd have their way with me. And then I was there, and do you know what? They'd make me want to enjoy it. And they were like, what? I said, that's how much of a kick in it would be. They'd be like, look like you enjoy it now, mate. And I said, I, I wouldn't be able to do anything because it was so... It, 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 and I know, like, we're making light of it, but, you know, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to use this to seek into a like, conversation me and you had. And you might not even remember it. It was after one of the Nogi uh, British Opens, and we were going to the car and we were talking, and we, we, we were talking about the, like, the, the old days of Jeff Thompson training, the animal days and stuff like that. We talked about violence. And it was, believe it or not, it was the first moment that I was like that, because I always liked you, Kev. But when I talked to you, and it was one of those moments where you talk to someone and you go, what I thought is violence, you know, where I've been in bar fights, did some door work, stuff like that, trained with tough guys. And then it was, as I as I went back into my car, I was like, like have a word with yourself, Nick. You're speaking to a guy who actually knows. Because we were talking about, you know, man's inhumanity to man, training, stuff like that. And it got pretty, like, I'm not saying heavy, but it was one of those, you know, one of those, I, how, I how many of you went with <laughs> yeah, you know how me and you talk sometimes, right? And we got there, and I remember you turned around, and you just went out, he goes, yeah, people think they know. He goes, I know real. I, I know what it's like. And then, like, and you only touched on it, and I don't want you to go into details, please, but I remember you saying about when you were in Bosnia and Kosovo, and you said to me, you went like, he goes, you want to see, see evil? 
I know evil. And I remember, because you said it to me, and I, I had to chill, because it was, it was one night, and it was mad, because I was a grown man who thought I knew about violence. And that, that was, like, if you don't mind, I'll get you to expand a little bit, if you don't mind, yeah. on just how people think it's a bar fight. And then you said that one sentence to me, and I was like, I'm such an amateur to understand that. Like, so you you mentioned the squally mentality. So mm. can you expand on, you know, what has got you to where you are now by seeing the stuff that you've seen? Um, I mean, I guess there's two levels and, and I'll, I'll caveat it first in, in that, um, you know, lots of people serve in the military and, you know, I'm, I'm nothing special. I did, you know, 10 years, um, had a great time, but there's people that have done way, way more than me and been in way, way worse situations than me. But, you know, I, I had a few. Um, <clears throat> there, I guess there's two sides. One was the barrack room mentality, because you live in the block if you're single, um, which is like a small block of flats usually. And a lot of times it's four person rooms or four man rooms because it's all, all guys at the time. Um, it may have changed a little bit now, but, you know, that that's pretty much... So you're basically in a block of flats of 100 squaddies in four-man rooms. And you're not... You know what I mean? And, and there's pressure through the day. You're away from home. You're away from family. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time based down in Lark Hill, which is only two hours away from Ellsbury. But you're away from home. You, you stay there every yeah. night. You know, you get weekends off, maybe, if you're not on tour. So tensions get high, you know, first of all, you've got your roommates where people not doing their laundry after a certain point. If you're at breaking point, I mean, I've seen people get their heads cracked open for swigging a Coke out of the wrong bottle of Coke, drinking someone's Coke out of the fridge. I've seen them get weighed in for that. Um, we had one situation where a guy was thought of as a hippie uh, and he got, he got ironed. They, the four of them held him down and they, they put a hot iron in his chest and ironed him. One of the guys went to Colchester Nick for it, but that happened wow. in the block. Yeah. Um, high suicide rates in the army through, through bullying and, and things like that. You, you see that tension build and, and sometimes it, you, people let off steam and a lot of times it'd be a dust up. Sometimes it'd be a fair square go. Yeah. But, you know, these are, not particularly nice stories, but I, I tend to tell them with a, a little bit of humour because they are funny in a certain way. I see a fight start where one guy was asleep in his bed still. So right. there's an argument downtown. One of my friends come to get me because he was going to have this fight. He goes, I can't remember the guy's name now, but say it's Smith. Well, we're going to go and get Smudge. We're going, I'm going to go and get Smudge. He was rude to me downtown, right? We've gone into the room and Smudge is in bed asleep. So I'm expecting my friend to wake him up and restart the argument. Worst case scenario, or walk out and go, I'll see him in the morning. Yeah. No, he just starts fighting with him. He gets two or three good shots in before wow. Smudge wakes up. And then Smudge wakes up and he's in a fight. Yeah. You know, and that was a Saturday night. Do you know what I mean? It was not, these aren't uncommon stories. I mean, I spent three months in Norway with the Paris as one of their drivers because I, I was Arctic trained. And I think it was one para took over the, the infantry role. And while they were doing their training out there, they just needed some other guys driving. So I was driving for them as a over snow vehicle driver so they could go and get their skiing practice in. One thing being a non para working with the paras is a is a is a rough yeah. day in the office. Yeah. And then two, just the way they handle their new guys. I mean, like I say. People have done much worse than me, and I see how hard they get it. It's a rough environment, so yeah. there's always this kind of air of potential violence. Yeah, you know, I'll push it in front of you in the dinner queue, in McDonald's. That's probably not going to kick off, but in the barracks or an exercise or an ops, yeah. it's probably yeah. going to kick off. You know, so there was yeah. a, there, there was that side. There was the actual in-house army side where there's always an air of violence. I mean, look, you don't tend to think of it like this, but now I'm a little bit older. You're going to get your gun from the armory because it's weapon cleaning day. Or, or we're going to have an afternoon. We ain't got much to do. So, lads, go and get your rifles out. Give them a clean. Put them back in the armory. That's what we're going to do. But what's that rifle for? It's a machine gun. Yeah. It's only got one use. You can't change the light bulb with it. Yeah. So, on your lap, you've got a machine gun that you're stripping down and cleaning. 
because you might need to use it. And what are you going to use it for? So yeah. there's always this kind of undertone of violence, you know, and when I was in the army, sergeants could get away with hitting you. I mean, that whole kind of, do you want to go on charge or do you want me to give you a kick in? That was a real option when I was in. And a lot of guys wow. would take the, yeah, I, I mean, I got, <laughs> I got caught speeding once that was in Norway and the battery captain who was an old ex para. So the battery captains are usually 25 year plus guys. And I'm a young 19 year old spinning around on the snow, just being a prat with the lads. Um, he come up, he pulled me out the truck, punched me in the stomach and stomped me in the snow and then just walked off shouting speed kills. And I knew I'd got away with something because I weren't going to go on charge. Yeah. So, you know, there's that. Um, and then you've got the external. Um, my tours of duty were uh, the Balkans. I spent about three and a half years in total in the Balkans, Bosnia and Kosovo. Um so again, that level of conflict compared to what my friends did in Afghanistan and Iraq um, was a much higher level of op tempo. You know, they were actually getting into firefights, putting a lot of rounds down. Bosnia was more minefields than type, um, but you did have the mass graves. And um, but one in particular, a village called McConishgrad. Um, we had to go and guard the mass graves because <clears throat> in this particular one, it was the Serbs that had created the mass grave and um, they were coming back at night to try and cover up the evidence. So they put lime on the bodies to decompose the bodies quicker. Yeah. They've lost it if they've left any gear there. So because they know that there will be eventually a long time down the road, maybe, but eventually some of this stuff will go to court or there will be reprisals for it. Yeah. So we were put there to guard the mass grave to stop any vandalism or desecration of the bodies. And in this particular one, um, there, there was hundreds and hundreds of people, not, not 10 or 20, wow. but, but hundreds. And all women and children, I mean, it's a bit, you know, wasn't weird looking, but, you know, this is why we were there. And it was all just women, children, and or if there was a guy, it, <clears throat> it'd be a very old guy. So no one of fighting age. So, so, so they had gone into this village and they had just rounded up non-combatants and killed them. And wow. they don't just kill them, mate. They, they desecrate the bodies. They cut the ears off because they keep them on a belt. Um, if they're pregnant, they cut the baby out. Seen that? Wow. Um, if they're really twisted, they'll push other stuff in. Yeah. So it's a bit dark. It's a bit dark. You know, I don't want to get too, too deep on it or whatever, but that's the yeah. level that it goes to. And that's why, and, and again, I have different feelings on governments and armies and, and stuff like that now. I think people generally do as they get older, but seeing some of the stuff that was going on in Ukraine when they started talking about um, yeah. mass graves and stuff, it... it, it it does affect you a little bit, you know, if you've been around that stuff, because you, you just feel how helpless those people would have been. And it's, it's yeah. and, you know, when people talk about knocking something, this is probably where our conversation stemmed from. You know, people talk about, oh, yeah, I've done this geezer in the pub. I had by him and knocked him out. You know, and I've been guilty of that kind of chat. You're like, you don't know where that stuff leads, mate. Or when people hate speech, you know, racist or, or whatever, any kind of bigoted speech. It's like, mate, you don't understand where that stuff can lead. It, get, it gathers momentum because the thing is, I, I've never, I've, I've never told you this, but when we talked about it, and it was the fact that you mentioned Bosnia and Kosovo to me because I got into the car because I lived in Germany for five and a half years, and so I and there were a load of Bosnians, only quite a few Serbs as well. And the the, the mad thing was, you, you're working on a building site, so you're working with all these different guys, and again, it's that whole thing where it's like, you know, oh, all. I Albanians are like that, you know, it's all Albanians are criminals, that all Romanians are thieves. Like, you know, uh, the one thing that, you know, to, to make a bit of a funny aside, every Polish guy I ever met has been a wrestler. I have to admit that, you know what I mean? Every Polish guy I ever met, they can kill you. But the thing the thing is, like you said it to me, and I was like, because I had the, I had the, a flashback to it when I was over, flashback, but it was, I was in a bar 
and it went really, really like you know, you know, when you just know yeah. the menace is coming in. And I was like, man, and there was all these guys in there, yeah. and it just the, the, the whole thing changed for a second. And my mate said to me, he goes, you better get out. And he was a Bosnian lad. And I said, why? He goes, they're all Serbs. And I was like, and I, I, I was ignorant of it all. But then obviously, as you get older, you look at it and you go, you know, so, some of it you start thinking to yourself, well, you know, they dictate a bit. None of them killed each other when they're all under the jackboot of Tito. You know what I mean? He kept them all, under, all, all yeah. in line then. But the thing was, like, it came in and it was one of those, like, and, you know, I had a gun pulled on me by an Armenian when I was in Germany. And I like, and I thought that was pretty rough. But when these guys came in and you were just like, somebody is going to get killed tonight in here. And my mate turned around to me and goes, this is nothing to do with you. You've got to get out of here now. And I said, what's going to happen? And he goes, we'll see. And then there was like a bit of machismo and everything. But I had no idea. And then when me and you talked about it, I remember that, as you said, that blood curdling feeling where you're like, like something bad's going to really, really happen, right? right? And it, and it, it like it, it is mad. It's like you were saying. It's like all of that hatred only starts from something small, and it gains momentum. And that's why you got to be very careful. You know, what I mean, everyone thinks it's ah, you know, Trump's just saying some bullshit. Let him do his own thing. You go. Unfortunately, mate, it goes on the wrong ears, mate. You know, for everybody who listens to the White Album, right. there's always Mark Chapman. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I don't think it takes much. I mean, it's an interesting part of the world. They've had because it's kind of almost where East meets West and Islam meets Christianity. And so through the centuries, it's, it's, it's been a tinderbox anyway. Um, but I can see that kind of stuff happening everywhere. I mean, oh. I started to think about um, Bosnia, Croatia and Serbia, almost like England, Scotland, Wales. We're all joined. Yeah. We're all intermarried. Everybody's related, like exactly like they were, where suddenly something went south You've got that weird mix, you know. And that's and what, and, and, well, this is good. This is going to lead me into it, like another conversation me and you had, right? Where I, I remember I told you I got a new hearing aid, and it it, it was ridiculous because the conversation went from we were talking about. I'd said to you, "Oh, have you watched Black Mirror?" And we we're on about the TV program, and you're like, oh, "I don't really watch much of that TV." And I, no, you'll like it, man. It's all about dystopian futures and everything, and then. I, I made an innocuous, like it was a proper innocuous remark. I went, oh, I've got a new hearing aid now. It's got Bluetooth on it and that, man. And I said to you, I said, man, I'm mad for this transhumanism stuff, man. I want to get all the cybernetic implants in me. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you turned around to me, went, no, mate, you don't want that. And I, do, do you remember the convo? Because you said to me, you go, yeah, because you turned around and go, no, no, no. He goes, what you want to do is you want to get embrace the savage. He goes, don't eat anything that's wrapped in plastic. Don't eat processed food. He goes, you want to go the other way? And I was like that going, nah, but you know, I'll have the fucking robot arm and that. I'll be like the winter soldier. No one will come more of me. I'm, like me being stupid. And then I went back, thought about it. And I was like, shit, man, Kev Capel's got me again. Made me do the complete 180 on it because that was it. So can you get, just exp explain the thoughts on embracing the savage? No, <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 we all kind of have these ups and downs where you know you, you you get these opinions um i just get a bit tired of the digital world <clears throat> um which is ironic because i'm in a zoom meeting right now um but i just get a bit tired of it and i think um when you step out and you go into nature um so we've got some nice woods up around here so you go into the woods for a, for a walk you feel different you know if you mm. disconnect from the internet and, and all that stuff. And you can stay off your phone. Cause I, I got the woods and I see people on the phone updating Instagram. It's like, yeah, I think you've missed the point, but, and I'm guilty. I'm look, and everything I kind of bitch about, I'm guilty of as well. You know, I eat fast food sometimes. I, I know what is better for me and what isn't. So I'm not trying to preach, but if you can disconnect from all of that social media and just put your phone away for a couple of hours and go out and be in nature, you'll feel better for it. You know, I yeah. think, I don't even think that's anecdotal at this point. I think everybody felt that during COVID where they could only go for a walk because the pub wasn't open. Suddenly everyone's like, I love walking in that. You know, I think no. sales of camping gear and stuff has gone through the roof since yeah. COVID. People realise that, you know, being out in nature is, you know, for whatever reason, is beneficial. And when you're on the smartphone all the time and always kind of plugged in and, and, you know, when you first put the phone down, you you miss it, you know. But 
if you're always plugged in, you do feel a bit weird sometimes, you know, that scrolling, that constant scrolling and, okay, close that app, open up the other one. I'm going to put the phone down, but before I do, I'm just going to check that app I just closed five seconds ago again. All of that stuff is a weird, you know, it's a weird thing. My friend was telling me the other day that they believe that ADHD has gone up a lot in grown-ups because usually yeah. you're born with ADHD, but now you can develop it later in life, which is like a new new thing and yeah. some of it's related to how the smartphones are set up and you know i could quite believe that so i think if getting out in nature and unplugging is good then putting the smartphone and stand you know not embracing all the new stuff is probably good as well you know rather than going okay i need the headset and this headset and the more plugged yeah. in i am the better i i'm i'm trying to do less and less of it i only yeah. really know do social media for the benefit of the gym, you know, because the lads are winning stuff. It's only fair that they get recognition for the stuff they're doing. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a business, so, you know, marketing and stuff. But most of my personal stuff now isn't isn't really online. I mean, I've got a grandson now and I love him to bits. So I can't help with him, you know, when he does stuff. I can't help but, put, you know, take a picture yeah. and put um, but that's a new thing. But but like me personally, what I'm doing, my training, my um, you know outdoor activities, or whatever, I don't really put any of that up. Now because... you say you you say you said something there, Kevin. You see, the thing is, it's like uh, you know we always go on about the algorithm and you know that the way that, that you know they know exactly what to hit you with. And if you are on about the ADHD, that is the truth because what we need is that instant gratification now. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, I, I was, believe it or not, ironically watching it on YouTube, a documentary yeah. on about social media. And the, they, what they did was one of the first things that they realised on Instagram was they, they looked at ways to get people addicted. So what they did was they went and went to Vegas of all places. And they were like, so how do you get, how did you manage to get people addicted to gambling? And what they, the, the, yeah, and you're thinking right that you're thinking game theory, you know, I'm going to go full Joe Rogan on it and go, oh, it'd be game theory. It's all, and it was like, no, what it was, they went back to the early days where you, you had that physical connection to a machine, you pulled down the lever, and then when right. you let that go, boom, you first of all, there's something manly about doing that. Secondly, yeah. roll, boom. And then they were like, so Instagram turned around and went, right, okay, so what we'll do is you will literally have to physically scroll downwards each time to refresh. And when you refresh, oh, there might be something that titivates me. Oh, you never know. I might get more likes. Guess what? Maybe mine might come up. And it was so funny because I looked at it and I went, shit, I'm dead guilty of that because I'm a bit like yourself, Kev. Uh, I, one of the things that's thrown at me all the time, my good mate Nathan Leverton always says it. Nathan always says, the, your biggest problem, Mick, is you on social media, that's not you. He goes, this loving, caring, great mate. He goes, go on it. And it's just some misogynistic dude telling dad jokes and being a complete prick all the time. And he goes, and he goes, why? And I went, mate, I'm like the comedian in The Watchman, mate. I know it's a joke. So, you know what I mean? I'm, I, you know, I know it's a joke, so I'm playing the joke. But it was, you, know, you said something earlier as well, which I, which I like. So the grandfather thing, right, as you know, the whole martial arts thing, you know, your son Keenan's an absolute ledge who's killing it at the moment, by the way. So I've got to really well. he's, yeah, he's killing it. Yeah. 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 But, you know, cool. He's a real hound. Uh, he's a real hound for long Yeah. Now. yeah, no, yeah. He's oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. No, he's definitely. Real... So what's, what's it like? What's it like to, you know, to be, to be a grandfather doing martial arts and still, if you don't mind me saying it, because I'm doing exactly the same at 53, still trying to find my way in the world. You know, reading Ernest Hemingway now and actually going, I get where you're coming from here, Ernest. Do you know what I mean? You know, because you, you think you're going to be grown up and you're not. What's it like being a grandfather? Um, I mean, I love it. I love it. I love the little, little lad to bits, Ezekiel. He, he's he's amazing. Um, I don't know. I mean, without... I don't know. It, it gives you another purpose to keep going, doesn't it? I mean, we all have these things. <clears throat> I think... Um, that keep us going, you know, Keen has always been that for me. Um, because when it comes to it, yeah, we all care about ourselves or whatever, but at the same time as men, and you tell me if I'm wrong, we don't really give a shit about ourselves. Like, 
if if you're on a journey going on a journey by yourself you'll pack different you'll go to the station different because you don't get a fuck it, if i miss the train i'll just get the next one if i have yeah. if i've got to pack something i'll just buy it when i'm there i don't care yeah. but like once you start going you take your missus or kids you're more organized because you care for their experience right you don't want them to be yeah. stressed or whatever so i think if we're completely by ourselves we don't really worry about ourselves that much. No. But when you've got people who depend on you for whatever, they don't depend on me, but, you know, I like having them around. Um, but when you have dependents, you know, kids, you you want to be there for them. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to miss anything. Do you know what I mean? I want to yeah. be there. Um, I want to be able to give them the benefit of my experience if they want it, you know, because they're going to come up against obstacles in their lives. And I just feel like I'll be in a good place to give him some some valid advice. Um, and watching the little man grow up, you know, he's already walking and stuff now. It's like, yeah, this is worth getting out of bed for. I mean, I've got, I mean, me personally, I've got tons of stuff to get out of bed for. You know, the, the gym, uh, the work I do outside of the gym, Keenan, now my grandson. I've, I've always had tons of stuff to get out of bed for. I've been lucky, but I understand why some people don't keep getting out of bed. I understand yeah. why they fall into that depression. And I think something like a, a, a new grandson or a grandchild, whatever, I think that is something that is just, you're just so connected to it as a human being, you, you, you can't help but be lifted by it. If I see him, it doesn't matter what's happened that day, I'll be in a good mood when I see him. Yeah. You know what I mean? What, whatever has happened in that day, it won't matter yeah, when I see him, I'll be happy for an hour. So, and it's not, you don't even have to try, you know, when, um, when my son and his, his, his partner, Sharice, when they said, um, that she was pregnant, I actually got like a rush of adrenaline. It was something uncontrollable to me. You know, it was like, wow, this is actually, yeah. you know, it's part of your DNA or something, something inside changes. So, yeah. um, being a granddad for me has just been like an amazing, it's been an amazing year with it. You know, it's been a rough year in, in some ways with other bits, but for him, having him around, yeah, it's been brilliant. Absolutely yeah, brilliant. Is, I look forward to seeing it. We see this thing, you know, Will's a, a new granddad as well, right? So r just recently, and then obviously when you were talking, you were saying about Keenan being a handful, it's like my son Jack, three strike purple mm. belt now. Right, yeah. yeah. Mustard, yeah, I think you might have ref a couple of fights for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, he's good. He's very good. Yeah, great, great guy. And the, the, like, it, it's mad because I don't want to sound like a real, real tit here. And if I do sound like a real tit, then people need to readjust what they think a tit is, right? Because I never thought when he was a little boy, and like as I said, I, I still see it now. And I, like, I go to his house and he's got a couple of pictures on his fridge of him as a kid. And you know, I my heart just goes, and I'm like, man, and I, I'm a bit good because I'm like that thinking. Man, all those great times I had with that little boy. And then as he's got older, it, and it is, it's one of those things, because when people say, oh, no, you'll love them even more, and you're like, there's no way, mate. Because, you know, you, again, there's two types of dads in the world, right? So there's the dads who spend time with their kids, and then there's dads who have to get the names tattooed on their arms because they forget the name of their kid, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't, and I know that sounds judgmental, but it's the truth. And I thought, no, I couldn't. And now Jack's like that. And I keep saying to him, I say, mate, I'm, yeah, I'm ready for a granddad, a uh, big granddad. I don't want to be an old granddad. I want to, like, I want to teach my grandchildren their first arm bar. I want, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to have the big Santa Claus beard on me, all of that caper. And, and, and again, it, it, it is funny because I, I link this into jujitsu now. It's like I'm now that just feisty old boy in the gym, and it's like yeah, you'll catch him, but he's going to punish you if you give him an inch. And he's going to make you work for everything as well. And then at the end of it, he's going to turn around. He's going to be dead thankful for it. Cause it I don't know about what you're like now, but I'm there and I'm with absolute savages. And they're turning around and saying, you're five years older than my dad, Nick. And I'm like, what? And they're like, my, my dad can't even get out of the chair sometimes. And I'm like, and it's the, it's the longevity. The, well, I don't know if it is the longevity, by the way, because the thing with jiu-jitsu is the minute you stop, Right, twenty minutes later, you can't move. There's no yeah. more going upside down. Like that's like, that's physics at work. A body in motion stays in motion. But it, what I'm framing the question here now is: is this massive upsurge in jujitsu? Is it the fact that you just feel great about yourself? 
Is it the mental health issues? Is it because between you and me, I don't think we, re- I don't think it's the having a rook with a bloke anymore in a, outside of a chip shop. I think we've transcended that. Yeah. So, you know, what is it? What is it for you, Kev Capel? What is it that puts you back on the mat every single day? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I've just always enjoyed it. I've just always enjoyed training. I mean, I don't know if there's any one thing that keeps me coming back. I mean, there's so many, so many things. I think the one that is popping up right now is the camaraderie. Um, I think that's one of the first things that kept me going to jujitsu because after you leave an environment like the army, you do kind of miss having the lads around you. You know what I mean? And, and, I think one of the reasons why guys like Reorg and, and, and things have been so successful, you know, with jiu-jitsu in the military is because it is an extension of your team. You know, you, 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 you're part of something and you're part of something that's not easy. Um, you know, and I know there's tons of good women martial artists, but from a man's point of view, being able to fight is a manly thing. You know, so, and you know, being in the army is kind of a manly pursuit. I, I use that word. I know it's probably not the right, you know, a bit of a dinosaur. I don't mean any disrespect, but from a from a young boy's point of view who was going into the army, it was a manly pursuit and you're around real men. And if you're in a fighter's gym or a pro- professional gym, you're going to have, you know, it's a manly pursuit and you're going to be around real men. Um, and, you know, luckily enough, you know, there's enough women and kids and everything that, that do this as well. Um, but I think that was what kept me coming back was I was going to see my friends and we were going to do something difficult. Yeah. You know, having a, having a five minute round with someone who's a little bit better than you, that's difficult. Yeah. And you're going to feel like you've been in a fight. And then I think nothing ever gave me as, as good a workout as jujitsu because of the sparring, you know, um, I've had, hard rounds on the pads, had hard rounds on tie pads, had hard rounds boxing, kickboxing. But you can only ever do, for me anyway, shorter sessions of that because getting punched in the head is is difficult. But sometimes you can have 10, 10 rounds of jiu-jitsu and you're not physically beaten up, but you're extremely tired. Yeah. And nothing's ever got me there other than jiu-jitsu, you know, like going running... I'll always kind of find a way to hold myself back a little bit or whatever. But jujitsu, because you've got another person there trying to do the exact opposite of what you're doing, it naturally pushes you to push as hard as you can. Or, you know, so I don't think anything has ever given me that kind of workout. And, you know, the endorphin release and then that self-satisfaction at the end of the day that you did something difficult, jujitsu gives you that in, you know, massive measure i mean the, the the days of me being worried about defending myself in a one-on-one situation i don't i don't tend to have those fears or, or feelings anymore one because i think i know that i've got my ego enough in check to avoid most confrontations that that's the yeah. main thing um and then if someone did want to push it then my conscience is clear because i kind of know i'm probably in the right because i avoid you know i always try and yeah. get a way to avoid confrontations because I know in my heart I'm trying to avoid it if I end up then swinging out with someone I know they're in the wrong yeah. so it gives me that moral you know that that, that moral edge not yeah. that that's you know, that hasn't happened but um, so the fight side of things isn't really a concern for me anymore it's, it's probably the camaraderie and then the satisfaction of having done a few rounds like I've, I've been a bit bashed up lately so I think Saturday, yeah, yesterday, I got a couple of rounds in wrestling and I felt great for it. You know, that satisfaction yeah. for the day going, yeah, I had some tough rounds today and I, I did okay. That That's, I don't think you can yeah, buy yeah, that. You, you, you've hit the right. nail on the head. I, we have this Friday nights. So, uh, you know my professor well, Neil Simpkin, right? You know, he's a homicidal maniac. He's a, he's a great guy. <clears throat> I love he Neil. He is. He's, he's he, been and a he, and he's a real old school. Well, you're head, you're head, head referee for his, uh, for his comp. Yeah, right? yeah. I, it's, I mean, I, I, I help uh, grow jujitsu, grow events, grow jujitsu events. Um, yeah. You know, because of Nat, you know, I've been friends with Natalie for a long time, and she's obviously married to Mauricio, who I've been friends with for a long time. Um, 
But other than that, I think it's only Neil and Katie that I will referee for now, really, just because I know their events are so well run and, and they're just such lovely people. Yeah, they're, they're, they are. They're, they're, they're great. It's like I always say this about Neil. So we said it for years. I train, like, I, for me, I can only speak from my personal experience. I don't think you could train with a tougher guy, right? You know, the, the late Nick Brooks, I'd put up there as well. You know what I mean? Like, like, I mean, just, I mean, like, tough, tough. Line, yeah. we are, yeah, man. We have, you, know, you know, the score, right? Right, killer. And it's like, he'd give you the shirt off his back, but, you know, he'd go like, you'll only get a stripe on your belt when you when you earned it. And he go, and then it'd be like, but, but we're friends, aren't we, Mick? So it's got to be truth there, right? And like that's going to lead me into this thing now, which is, uh, I think it might have been Tom De Blas said it years ago. You don't know the price of anything until you've got something you can't buy, which was like, which is the black belt in jiu-jitsu, right? Uh, but the thing, the, the thing that I've noticed when you mentioned reorg, you know, recently, internet went mad. Went on even like mainstream media, like Tom Hardy rocks up. He got kicked in the head, got kicked in the head by one of my teammates, David, yeah. big Polish guy, right? And he rolled, first of all, his jiu-jitsu is really, really good. Secondly, every, like, you know, because I really believe this, right? You can't fake being a nice guy that much because, mm. it, like, social media goes, and it's like, f after about 300 pictures of him with kids doing this or pointing at the kid, and I'm like, well, where's the Hollywood star there, right? So, like, famously, like, Russell Brand started jiu-jitsu with you, right? Or you gave him his blue. Uh, he, trains with, he, trains with, he trains with one of my black belts, Chris Clear. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he come to one of my graders to get his blue belt. Yeah. But, but like, this... At mine. And I've been down and trained with uh, Chris and, and Russell a, a couple of times, but um, Chris, Chris Clear is his instructor. Yeah. yeah. But, but the, the, sorry, to, uh, yeah, to get that right, but... The thing is, you got the you got these guys now. Uh, like I, I remember the first real celebrity that I knew that did jujitsu was Paul Walker, the guy who was in the Fast yeah. and the Furious, right? Yeah. So he was the first guy. But apart from uh, you know, Al Bundy, you know what I mean? Everyone knew that Al Bundy was a black belt in jujitsu. That's but, right. Yeah. yeah. So you know what? What is it? Do you think that drives people like every, every interview I've ever seen with Tom Hardy? He comes over as a very intelligent man. Russell Brand, I consider myself a well-read. He's, individual he's and he's a he's like a brainiac so yeah what is it like what Bruce. is it that, yeah so what is it what is it that's bringing these guys to jiu-jitsu from your opinion well i mean the same stuff that brings us to it for sure um but what i believe the celebrities get is the celebrity doesn't matter and yeah. Most of the time, jujitsu is pretty real. They will just be on the mat as a white belt and then a blue belt. You know, Russell Brand doesn't get to stand at the front of the queue because he's Russell Brand. He stands a few down because he's a purple belt. Yeah. And that's probably a massive weight off his shoulders. And I haven't spoke to him about this, so I don't know. I'm just using Russell because he's a celebrity I know. Um, but I know that Henry Cavill trains a lot at Rogers, does privates with Roger, and yeah. um, he, he was um, he was coming to Rogers quite a bit. And I think, you know, they probably don't get to high five and hug and 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 be spoke to like a normal person by normal people very often when they're when they're Hollywood level of fame. <laughs> and one, we maybe we bring them down a peg or two because if they're new, they're going to get beaten up. Even if they are Superman in the in the fake world, he's not Superman or Rogers, right? Yeah. So the white belt, he's going to get twisted up. That's a humbling experience, and they probably don't get humbled much if they're successful millionaires. I don't, I don't know because I'm not a successful millionaire. But <laughs> you know what I mean. But I think yeah. that part of their world that probably weighs quite heavy at times, probably is stripped away from them in the Jiu-Jitsu Academy. And you know, Mauricio has always said this: doesn't matter how much money you got in your bank. When you when you're on the mat, it's just you, your gear, and your belt, and, yeah. and that is probably quite a lot of weight off their shoulders sometimes. Yeah, you, you, well, you see this. Is, yeah, you see. You, yeah, you've just hit on something there. I, I've said it before. When people ask me why I love jujitsu so much, and I'm like, I'm a middle child, I'm Irish, and I'm Catholic. So the problem is, like, I, I embrace, you know, 
that there's a there's a real masochistic side to me and if it if it isn't painful i don't believe it's worth it and and, and i have to admit I, as i'm getting older i have to reconcile that with the whole you know where you're getting beaten up and you, you're feeling beat up sometimes and it, but i like i've been spending a lot of time thinking about this because I, I, I there's a line i pull out all the time when i'm rolling with the guys i'm like come on lads in 16 years time i'm 70 how can't you batter me you know what i mean and like you're rolling around you're having a laugh and everything but it's like i'm looking at it and i'm thinking the old danny's danny no santo thing which is he only started jiu-jitsu at 59 and like mm. that's going to lead me into like what i think because like, i love your take on this the few like i had a conversation years ago we went down to train at rogers uh labbrook grove he was getting ready for his MMA fight. James Zickick was there. Monstro was there. And I went down with Braulio and Neil. And um, Sticky was there as well. Uh, Dave Iverson from yeah, Julia Tampa. Yeah. yeah, Sticky, top guy. And we were going down there. And I said, what am I going to do here, mate? I think I was a blue belt at the time. I said, what am I going to do? And Neil says, oh, no, no, no. We're not doing jiu-jitsu. We're sparring. So I went down there. And we're all in the car. We're having a bit of a crack at that. And Braulio, we're having, like, saying to Braulio, uh, I'm saying, mate, you know, everyone thinks jiu-jitsu is great at the moment. I said, but wait until normal people and kids get into it. I said, because we're only hitting the demographic of the, you know, the 16 to 32-year-old male. You know, guys who read Loaded magazine back 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I said, now people are getting into it. And like, I don't know about you, Kev. I've never seen anything explode. This is like the old, old karate boom of Bruce Lee, right? And that's yeah. what we're seeing right now. Is the sky the limit, or what? What do you, do you think it's going to get diluted, like everyone says it's going to? Or, or what's your take? No, um, <clears throat> I don't think things keep growing. I think you know, um, or certainly not at the rate that we've experienced in the last fifteen years. I don't know. Is football still growing? Yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it, it, yeah, but it's part. Of, yeah, but see, it's part of it's part of society now. I think that's yeah. where jujitsu is going to be. No, and I think that's that's what I mean. You know, I think eventually, um, especially with the UFC, the UFC has been a really big help for function. You know, functional martial arts, for want of a better term. But I think everyone knows what I mean by that. Yeah, stuff that actually works and or would work. I know you you can make all kinds of arguments, but. MMA, and in particular UFC, um, has made this a cultural thing, like a global culture thing rather than just because it is global. And anywhere where there's young men, they'll be fighting of some kind. You know, you just get two brothers together, they'll, they'll be fighting. So we've all kind of got this in us. Um, so I think MMA has become part of global culture. And... As long as there's MMA, there'll be an element where you need to know what you're doing on the ground. Yeah. And there's always some naysayers who, because we put a label on it and called it jujitsu, they will want to put a different label on it and call it Sambo or CSW or Niwaza, whatever. But I think at this point, you can call it what you like. It's, it's, it's jujitsu. Or for me, it'll always be jujitsu, in particular Brazilian jujitsu. Because they, they were the guys that did flip the switch a little bit and, and make everybody... If there's one thing that can't be denied, in 93 in the UFC, people realised, even maybe not the first one, but by the third one, people were definitely like, do you know what? You need to be able to grapple. And wherever you go to learn that grappling is irrelevant, but the Brazilians showed it first. They showed yeah. it to the world. Um, but yeah, as, as long as fighting involves punching and kicking clinching and standing and, and taking your person to the ground and then controlling someone on the ground and either hitting them or submitting them. As long as a fight always looks like that, jiu-jitsu will always have a place and more and more people will probably want to do it until it gets to saturation point or weird laws come in where you're not allowed to do fight sports anymore or, you know, stuff like that. But I think it maybe, maybe how about this, Mick? How about this? How about it's, it was already in the culture already, but it just was a bit dormant and it was just being reawakened because there's always been folk grappling and, and you know, people have always fought. The rules got changed. I mean, there was gra- people were fighting MMA until the Marcus of Queensbury started breaking things up and 
right? Yeah. So they, they used to have an all. They used to have an all in. It, yeah. it, that was what it was. It was an yeah. all in. And then obviously, like you know, I'm a bit of a bit of a purist when it comes to this sort of stuff. It was like you go and train with James Fig. He weren't just boxing, you were learning the short stick, the cudgel, you know what I mean? And he, he wanted you to grapple as well. And it was it, it's like it is what you were saying. It's like with when you said flip the switch, it like it that got me going because it is cultural. It's like I saw an interview with you a couple of months ago where you were talking about the uh, where that the, now it's like Islam Makachev come in. Yeah, yeah, you did mention this by the way, but you're on about Islam and Habib and stuff. And it was like Islam came in and he made Charles Oliveira look like an ordinary guy. Yeah, like, so, and it was like you, you mentioned about how Sharapova, she was a champ. And then next right. thing you know, they, they, they inspire, right? And it was like you said, the Dagestani thing, because I really liked how you said it. So I'd like you to say, you know, we were talking about uh, the, the, the Prangley fight. With with Roger, yeah, with Roger, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you give that breakdown, please, because I, I love the way that you explained it. Well, I mean, uh, everyone was commenting on um, Habib's Dagestani handcuff because that's kind of you know a, a signature move in his grappling, where he's got the the arm trapped from around the back and the wrist trapped. And um, when I watched Roger fight Trevor Prangley, he used exactly the same move, and, and I like to talk to Roger about this this kind of stuff. And I said, oh, I see you using that. And Habib uses it a lot and they call it the Dagestani handcuff. I just wondered, you know, like, why well, use it? And he's like, yeah, because that's how you do it properly. Because <laughs> he's a good grappler. That's why he does that move. He understands right. grappling. And, you know, it's, I mean, this goes back to Bruce Lee. You can give stuff labels all you want, you know, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's just martial arts. It's just when something's done right, it's done right. You know, I've seen boxers do reverse punches like they're doing karate, you know, to the body. Really? They land it and, it, and it, 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 you know, it wins people. Um, if, something's, if something's done properly... A, a punch is a punch. A punch is a punch and a kick is a kick, man. Yeah. That That's literally it. I'm just going to ask you, in all of the martial arts that you've done, right, was there anything that you'd like to have, you know, studied but you didn't do? Or is that something that you're looking... Looking towards that, it could be another grappling art, could be a striking art, it could be something that just now, as you're getting older, you think might suit you. Um, not not the <clears throat> not the springs to mind. I mean, I think I was always um, searching for some good wrestling back in the day when I was doing MMA. Some someone who really knew wrestling. Um, we had a guy who was NCAA Division Two. Uh, at Rogers, he might have been Division One, but I'm, I'm, I think it was Division Two. Uh, Damien Switnik, right. great wrestler, and when I wrestled with him, you could feel the difference. And I, I, I never made it down to the Tokyo at London Bridge because London was tricky. You know, if I was, if I'd gone to London, I wanted to train at Rogers, and if I trained at Rogers, I was too tired to go into a rest. You know, a new wrestling session. So I, I always, I think. There's actually a, a guy in, in Ellsbury now who does some, some, I think it's some Eastern European wrestling. I think he's Romanian. Um, I'm not, you know, I kind of, I wrestle okay now. I've kind of got a little bit of a game. We, we wrestle on a Saturday morning at my gym. We've got some good wrestlers here. But I think back in the day, if there was one regular class as easy to get to as judo or boxing, then I wish it had been wrestling. You know, I wish there'd just been some really decent wrestling coach in the area that I could have got to, you know, because travelling to London two or three times a week for me was about the limit of how much I could travel for training, yeah. you know, financially and physically and, and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, for the people that don't know, the trip to Rogers was, I, I got lucky with Mauricio's first place, it was less than an hour. But then after that, it was always an hour and a half on a good run. So then yeah. you'd have to allow two hours because you don't want to be late. Yeah. So time consuming and, um, you know, there's a financial burden to, to training as well. So finding something in London, it, it didn't fit because I wanted my black belt. You know, yeah. or, to be fair, I, I wanted to be that level. The belt 
is significant, but I wanted to get really, really good at jujitsu or, or try and be the best I could be at it. So that's what, that was my purpose in London. But if there'd have been some wrestling on a Monday night in Ellsbury somewhere, then that would have been awesome. You know, a, a good American coach or Eastern European coach or, or, or now knowing what we know, a Dagestani coach, they yeah. had a dummy wonders. They had a dummy wonders. I think I'm smart enough to figure some stuff out. But yeah, if there was one well, thing missing... Yeah, that, you that see, this is wrestling's the one. You know, I remember years ago, I spoke to Bisping about it. And Bisping, like, cause Bisping's kid's a killer. Like, and you, yeah, you'll good. see him... Yeah, and you see him on Instagram now, and, it, and, like, and Michael turned around and go, can't do anything. But I remember, spoke to Bisping, I spoke to Dan Hardy about it, and it was like, we're... My generation, he goes, we're not going to make it. He goes, because it's that wrestling base that these guys have got. You know, it's like, you know, Bisping always says, yeah, he got lucky. He got lucky, like, and again, from that one sparring session against Rockhold in the gym and then went viral on it. And it was like, so, yeah, what was it like? He goes, unofficially on the Strike Force middleweight champion, right? And he just made that one remark and then Rockhold went mad. He managed to get in there. And it was like he said, he goes, he knows he was quite lucky in the second fight, right? So he knows that. But the wrestling, especially because I'm a big fan of wrestling, like I'm, I'm from carnival wrestling from the old days of like, you know, Farmer Burns, Frank Gotch, Carl Gotch, Hacken Smith, all of those, like, as you were saying, it, it sounds really lame when I say it, but like manly dudes who were like, you know, they were killers. And then it, right up to like, even, you know, like John Smith, you know, you, you see a John Smith single leg and you're like that going. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's Picasso to me. That like that's I, I don't know what I can't I can't do that. I don't really understand the mechanics. All I know is I'm just seeing greatness at work. It's like you know when you watch Fox, Fox Catcher the movie and you see it and like because that's Rocky for wrestling, right? Good and film. you look at it. Oh, it's a great film and it's unreal. Yeah, wrestling's one. And I don't know about you. What I find is paradoxically, you speak to people about wrestling in the UK, they will go, "What Big Daddy, Giant Haystacks." Yeah, no clue. I, mean, I, I guess that's evidence that it's in the culture, but it's been so pantomime, you know, it's like a pantomime. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I grew up watching wrestling on a Saturday afternoon, Big Daddy, yeah. and, and and that is what people think when you say wrestling in the UK. But again, it does kind of prove that it's in the culture. Okay, it's a comedy form, yeah. but there, there's, there, you know, wrestling was something people would go and watch. Well, yeah. I you, it go, doesn't, you, it go, you go up to the snake pit, you go to Wigan, you go to you go to old Billy Riley's when it was a Billy Riley snake pit. Those guys, and they were guys, like, I can't imagine how tough those guys were. Working yeah. down a mine, doing like jobs that no one wanted. And then what? how do you relax? I, tra I strangle my mates. And I, like even as I'm saying that, I'm laughing. I go, what do you do? I plaster all day and then I go and strangle my mates. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't feel like a tough guy. And you're thinking, maybe they didn't either. Maybe it was just what they did. Uh, yeah. What what I'd like to like to just wrap up on, right, Kev, is like it's more um and, and this is pure vanity on my point here to ask you this, because I've never asked you this, because we've talked about stuff uh that's always got like a philosophical lean into it, right? And like I, I I'll admit to you, I got into stoicism for literally I fell into it. I wanted to I've always wanted to study philosophy. Like, this is what I'm going to do. At 60 years of age, I'm jacking the plaster in and I'm going back and I'm going to do a degree in philosophy. First of all, because I'll never be able to pay the tuition fees back because I'll be dead. I'll never have to pay back the student loan because I'm going to be able to work out a way that makes it look like I'm going to do it. And do you know why I want to do it? Because I want to be a philosopher. I want to sit there with my thoughts, think about heavy shit, write it down and try and make sense of it all, right? And the thing is, you're probably one of the most philosophical people I know, and we've never if we've never talked about this. Like, like, have you like formally even read anything about philosophy, or is this all just empirical shit you picked up along the way? Mainly shit I picked up along the way, to be fair. But <laughs> um, I'm aware of philosophers, you know, Seneca and, and Stoicism, you know, Stoicism and. Um, I've probably listened to a few audio books on it, but no, I'm not, I'm not well read, but I think, um, I think it's hard 
to have been studying martial arts as long as we've been studying it and for it just not to creep in because Bruce Lee wouldn't be up there as one of the world's top philosophers unless you know martial arts and then you'd yeah. know what he was really about and how smart he really was. Um, if you have a conversation with Roger, he's one of the most stoic people in the world, mate. Mm -hmm. When you think about the things that he's achieved in his life and how easy he's made it look, and I know it weren't easy because I see him train for this stuff. You don't get no bullshit out of him. And he's a very, very deep thinker. Mm -hmm. Only when you ask him his opinion on a fight, you'll get a very deep opinion, a very, you know, he'll prove his depth of knowledge. And he's not trying to prove his depth of knowledge. It certainly feels like he's having a natural conversation. Yeah. But someone like me, I look at it and I'm like, man, he's stoic. He's a proper stoic. You know, one of the things he said to me, I think I was competing in a blue belt. He said something like, Whoever controls their emotions the best, the best will win the fight. So he wasn't even talking about who's the toughest, who's got the best technique. For a long time, he, you know, he's like, you've just got to control your emotions. Yeah. It, it's funny. Which makes a lot of sense. It, 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 it's funny you say this because Neil Simkin always says it because he, he he quotes it. Neil won't mind me. Yeah. The beauty with Neil is Neil's one of my best friends in the world. He didn't even watch my interview with him. So I can say whatever I want here because I know he'll never hear it, right? No, but yeah, he, he, yeah he's, he's, he's such a cool guy, Neil is. But it was like Neil said, said to me, he goes, one of the most profound things he ever heard from Roger was Roger was giving out, like, so he's coaching somebody. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's, no pass, no pass, the usual, the usual Brazilians, how they do it, you know. And it, Roger was just shouting and he was doing, yeah, he was doing fire in the belly, ice in the brain. And he was just going fire in the belly, ice in the brain, fire in the belly, ice in the brain. And then Neil's saying it to me and I'm going, i got fire in the brain and ice in the belly and a full pair of underpants, mate. I said, I don't even want to be here. I'm shitting it. But yeah, this stoicism thing is, I, like, I don't know about you. It's like, I'm reading this and like, especially Seneca, you know, Seneca uh, Aurelius as well you know, uh, Cicero, these guys, I'm reading this stuff and I'm like, this is like 2022, Coventry. Mm -hmm. You wrote this yeah. how many thousand years ago? And all of it is not even relevant. I'm like, shit, this guy's talking to me. Yeah. And, and, as, and, and it's one of that, because it's a philosophy. As it, it, I, I really believe this. So like, it's, it just forgive me for this one. Um, it just, you yeah. know, indulge me this bit i think that sort of philosophy is like whiskey it's the sort of thing that unless you're old you won't appreciate it you know it's you know you understand where i'm coming from it's yeah like, i mean my, my brain yeah. works completely different now to how it did when i was a young young guy i mean yeah all that knowledge was was wasted on me really uh you know when i was young and in the army i either i thought i knew best or my sergeant knew best and, and if you weren't part of that you didn't know what was going on. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. and if I didn't know what you were talking about, it wasn't important. That's why I didn't need to know it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, probably, probably a lot of young men are like that. But now I'm like, but if I don't know it, I need to take a look at it and figure out whether it's worth knowing or not. So philosophy has crept in and then, then it popped into my head then actually. I get a lot of Seneca quotes when I scroll on Instagram. So, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, the algorithm algorithm knows us well, man. It, it knows. knows. Us. And, but, and guys like Jordan Peterson, even Joe Rogan with his podcast has, has brought so many different aspects into the way I look at things. And, and because I used to listen to the Rogan podcast almost religiously because he had guys that were fighters and they spoke about MMA or comedians, which are funny, and they talk about MMA. So... I didn't want to listen to Radio 1 or, or watch the news or whatever. So I'd watch Rogue whenever it come out. I'm not really like that anymore. What I tend to do now is I'll watch an interesting one and then I'll start going on that person's podcast or, or watching their films or their documentaries. And so Jordan Peterson, Jocko Willink, I'm a big fan of because he's a military guy and yeah. he's an amazing guest. If you're a military fan, 
some of the guests on his podcast are, are out of this world. The guys that work behind the lines in Vietnam, the, the SOG guys yeah. working in Cambodia and Laos, them podcasts are amazing. They're, they're yeah. amazing. But Jordan Peterson on the philosophy side, would you call Peterson a philosophy? Jordan Peterson. Peterson. Would you class yeah. him as? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, well, you see, this is the thing. I've got friends of mine, like yeah, my good friend Nathan Leverton hates Peterson, right? Hates him with a passion. And he goes, I can't believe you don't like him. And I went, I can't believe you don't like him. And then, like, and what I'll do is every now and again, I'll go on Facebook, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll put, I'll put up something about Peterson, and then I go, great man. And they go, he was addicted to painkillers, ah. And I went, all good men stumble. And then they go, oh, he was, a, he reckons he and me. And I'm like. All get all good men make mistakes, and like the thing is with Peterson, the, the again, my like, I, 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 I tr not only do I, I agree with probably about seventy percent. The thirty percent I don't agree with, I really don't agree with. Like I'm, I'm it's like it's literally it's like a one eighty turn. It's it's a bit like um, I listen to Ben Shapiro, and I like twenty percent of what he's got, but the twenty percent I like, I really like. But with Peterson, what I like is I like the way that he uses analogies from old stories, yeah. like biblical stories, and then he'll bring Harry Potter into it. Then he brings zeitgeisty stuff into it as well. And then uh, the thing with Peterson, what I liked about it, where everyone was going crazy, because he, he came to the forefront on that compelled speech thing, right? And he was saying, there's never been a time in English common law where you've been told to say something. And then he said, the problem is all tyranny starts from a good place. Chairman Mao never got into power in, into China and go, I'm going to kill 50 million of you guys. He thought he had their best interests at heart, right? And when everyone gives me a hard time about Peterson, I'm like, but you've got to remember, Peterson, the first thing he did was a caveat behind everything that he said was, at the moment, what you're saying, I get it. There's some empathy behind it. People's feelings are being hurt. and you, you don't want to make anyone go through life having a shit time. But at the moment, you're saying for me to do something nice. In five years' time, you might be getting to say something else. And then that, and, and it's a dark road you go down. So I really like Peterson. And even with all this stumbling, I still like him. But I, more now, I listen to more Lex Friedman than anyone because he's just an interesting guy. Yeah, you know Roger's I, mean? going on, I think Roger's going on Lex Friedman in the next couple of weeks. No way. Oh, that, that'll be really yeah, good. It's coming up soon. It'll be on there soon, so it'll be worth a look. Yeah, well, you well, you see, this is... I I, 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 spoke, I, I was speaking to a few mates of mine, and uh, me and Nathan were chatting about this, me and Nathan Leverton, and I said, yeah, because I used to always embarrass Nathan and call him the English John Danaher, because he was footlocking, and, like, again, with, with Nathan, Nathan had to basically teach himself, because there was nobody out there. So like, and he became one of the most successful grappling coaches in the UK in early MMA, right? And we were talking about, it and I, he goes, "Oh yeah, but I find Danaher really boring." And I went, "But I've trained with John. John is really boring. He's great at jujitsu and interested in the stuff he's interested in. But then everything after that, not really. He's a bit like Rain Man in a, in a rash guard. You know what I mean?" But I said to him, "I said, look, I was Lex Friedman and him together." two guys with monotone voices, right? So it was almost like listening to like, like audible mo Mogadon, because I, I was feeling like they put me to sleep. But what they were saying was so profound. I'm like, man, it's unreal. Is there anybody out there that you'd like to be a guest of, apart from Joe Rogan, obviously, and me, right? Who, who would you do a show with if you had anybody you could pick? Um, well, I'd like to sit down with Jocko. He's pretty cool. Um, but again, my, my stories from the army aren't like the ones I've listened to on his show. I mean, he has some real legit tip of the spear guys on there, but I like Jocko. I think his podcast really good. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I say, lately the social media stuff, I don't, I don't really listen to a lot. I don't really watch a great deal. Um, just mark it in the gym. So I don't even know <clears throat> who's got who's got what going on now with podcasts and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, Jocko. Jocko was uh, a good one to listen to back in the day. Jo Jocko still is. And the thing is, man, he talks the talk. He's got that origin company. He's legit. He's, legit. And he's, he's investing in everything. He invests in all the people around him. And he's yeah. used... And like we live in interesting times because people are using this platform now. Like Joe Rogan, 
I always liked him on Fear Factor. I thought he was a decent enough comedian. Like saw him train like a savage, really inspirational. But even even like he says, I had no idea it was gonna do you think do you think he thought he was gonna be a billionaire out of this? He smashed it, mate. He's absolutely killed it with his podcast. Fair, fair play to him. Yeah, like you say, you know, I didn't really have an opinion on him before. I thought he was a good MMA commentator, and obviously being a jiu-jitsu guy and him commentating, breaking down the jiu-jitsu the way he did. I respected him for that. But yeah, his podcast I enjoyed, but yeah, no one see it. Hundreds of millions of pounds on Spotify. Yeah, but yeah, but we never thought we never thought, you know, Mexican ground karate was gonna never gonna take off either, Kev. And look that where is. we are today, mate. It's yeah. real. But bro, I tell you what, what we'll do is we'll sign off on that because I know you've had a real busy day. Uh if you want to give a shout out, I know we've we've like lambasted social media savagely, but Ironically, it is our master. So, do you want to give a shout out like, to your socials so that people can find out more about you? If you're in the Aylesbury, if you don't mind me, I'm doing the infomercial for you here. If you're in the Aylesbury, Aylesbury area or, or the surrounding areas and you want to train with literally one of the nicest guys, and as I said at the start of the show, right, a real OG, which you are, you're, you know, you, you there at the beginning, Professor Kev Capel's the man, I'm telling you. So, Kev, where can they get you? Uh, the main place now is the gym in Ellsbury, <clears throat> RGA Bucks. We're right in Ellsbury Town Centre by the train station, um, rgabucks.com. We've got a bunch of, of really good coaches here, not just for me. Um, all the coaches here are fantastic. Come down, we give you a week free trial. Come see whether you like it or not. Simple as that, really. Kev, you're the man. I'll tell you what, I, I'm so glad it's taken me six years to get to you, right? But, uh, mate, it, it, it's unreal. Uh,